Hi everyone, welcome to our walkthrough of all the fresh new features you found in your system this Monday morning. As usual, you'll find a handout, which is simply a PDF copy of the slides available for download under the handout section for the GoToMeeting panel. That is uh, there for you during the meeting, but will not be provided in your follow-up email. So if you'd like to grab that, please do so now. Of course, if you miss out, I'm happy to uh, send those to you. I think I've met all of you before, but if not, my name is Megan. Um, I'm the Director of Client Training and Engagement at Exact, and your fearless leader for today's webinar. So we'll give it just a minute or two uh, for a few other people to join us, and we'll get started kind of right at three minutes after nine, so we'll just give it one more minute. I do like good timely starts, so back with you in just a few moments. All right, why don't we go ahead and dive in? I don't want to keep you guys waiting. Um, so as I mentioned, these are the new features that you'll find in your system uh, as of Monday of this week. So as you know, we release new features every six to eight weeks. So you'll look for our next release coming up at the tail end of April. So let's take a look at what is new in March. As usual, we'll go section by section through the system. I'll show you some screenshots uh, highlighting what is new and talk you through how those features are best utilized. If you have any questions that come up throughout our webinar, you can use the Q&A panel. I'll keep an eye on that as we're meeting. Um, and I'll be happy to um, pause and take questions at any time. So go ahead, interrupt, ask your questions. Um, I actually love being interrupted. Otherwise, I'll just keep talking. Um, so without further ado, let's take a look at what is new. So we're going to start uh, first with the uh, student side of things and what's new in the student section. The first place um, that we kind of dove in on is creating a setup section for your students. So as you may have noticed throughout the system, there's you know this, this navigation ribbon at the top that takes you through the natural life cycle of using any feature when you move left to right. And for more and more sections, we're having that first section on the left be set up, right? Before you start managing your students, you have to get things set up and ready to go. So there's a couple of new features here. Um, the first one is the student view. So this is our first step towards giving you the power to decide what your students can see. So we've got a couple of different options options here. These are mostly focused on the clinical coursework page and what your students will see there. Over continuing releases, you're going to see more and more and more things added here. So this is just the first step towards what will become a really powerful section of the system. So you can decide, do you want to show housing and parking information to your students or not? Do you want to give them the ability to add their own clinical instructors or preceptors or fieldwork educators? Or do you want them only to be able to use the ones that the school has added as a part of the placement? Do you want to share contract documents with your students? Do you want them to see the names and contact information of other students who are placed at that clinical site from the same academic program? So some of these features were turned on kind of by default before, and we found that it was kind of cumbersome for people to say, okay, well, I wanted to share contract documents, but now I don't. And they'd have to go into each site and every contract and turn them all off one by one or ask the support team to help out. Whereas now you can just flip this switch. Um, the same thing for other students who are placed here, right? You'd have to go into each rotation and say, yes, I'd like to show other students who are placed here, or no, I would like to not show other students who are placed here. Um, and now you can take either the, the sweeping action of turning them all on or all off, or the action of doing that individually. Um, and I'd suggest reaching out to your CSR the first time you use this feature because it's kind of a two-part thing, right? So if you have the contract documents turned on here in student view, but none of your individual documents are turned on, nothing is going to show. So we have to have a yes in two places. 
the ability to share a contract has to be on and the contract you want to share has to be on. And we decided to do that to give you that selective ability. We didn't want to say, oh, share all or none. We wanted to give you the ability to configure within that. Um, so connect with your CSR the first time you, you work through this. The same is true for other students placed here. There's a few intricacies to be aware of, um, but really this is a great step forward in terms of seeing what your students are controlling rather what your students are able to see and more to come here in our next releases. The other section we have is uh, the student organization section which you'll see um, here at the at the top I'm trying to get my laser pointer on which you'll see here at the top and what that does is it allows us to create a couple of new fields so we have a field called campus and a field called category. So not only have we given you these new fields, but we've also given you the ability to create these fields in terms of what do you see in that dropdown. So if you don't have multiple campuses, you don't need to worry about setting anything up here, right? It's not a required field. Same with category. If you want to use that, great, go ahead. And if you don't, no problem. You don't have to set that up. But we realize that a cohort of students and the group, which is a subset of the cohort, took us a long way towards giving people the ability to categorize their students and organize their students in the way that they wanted to. But many programs need even more than that, right? They might want to say, is the student on a particular specialty track? Or what type of enrollment do they have? Are they online? Are they residential? Are they part-time, full-time? And so we decided to give you two additional fields with which you can do whatever you would like. So you can figure your drop down options and you can apply them. So this really puts a lot of nice control in your hands. This is coming to you in two phases. So phase one is we've created these categories and you can choose your drop down options. You can figure it all yourself. You don't need to bother the support team or wait for their response. This is all easy to do on your own. So that's step one. Step two, which you'll see in our coming release, is that we'll, we'll give you the ability to filter by these types of fields everywhere else in the system. So for example, today, if you wanted to say, I'm making placements, let me focus only on the students in this category, or I'm checking learning activities, let me focus only on the students at this campus. We don't have those filters available yet. So you can get started with configuring this, the filters are available within the student section, but they are not yet available for you elsewhere in the product. That's phase two that's coming in our next release. Um, but this gives you guys the time to get started with creating these categories and laying the groundwork for organizing your students in the way that you'd like to. We've also finally connected the dots on requirement tracking. So when you make a placement, you select the program requirement at the time of making that placement. And you do that right here. And what happens when you select the program requirement, for example, I selected family medicine here. It used to be that that was kind of an information only field and it didn't do much. Um, but what we've done with this release is we have, I'm sorry, my laser pointer is going crazy here. <laughs> we have um, made it now so that when you update a requirement at the time of placement, that carries forward to the students um, to the students profile and they can see sort of what's going on that automatic updates the students profile they see their green check mark or their red x um, and that's immediately visible to the student before you had to update that manually so we've taken away that manual work a couple of things to make sure that you guys are aware of here so this is going to be in place for all new placements moving forward so for placements that you've already made in the system, this is not going to be retroactively applied, right? Because we know that you guys have likely either taken the time to update these manually or don't much care to update them. This is not something that's a priority for your program. So this will apply only for new placements moving forward. If you make any changes to a placement in terms of the requirements that it meets, that will update, no problem. What we're still working towards is figuring out how to handle the situation of you've deleted a placement, right? So if you delete a placement, it will not become unchecked on the student side. So again, another example of phase one, we're continuing to make progress, but this idea of when you check it at the time of placement, it checks it on the student's profile and it updates on the report as well. When you make changes 
the student's placement, it updates on the student's profile, it updates on the report, and we're still working through a few other um, a few other pieces of that um, for the next release. The other thing is uh, when this green check mark goes into effect. So right now, the green check mark will go into effect on the student's profile on uh, after the last day of the placement. So for example, if the student's placement ends today, March 30th, then we would see the green check mark appear the morning of March 31st, because the system knows with relative certainty that the student has then completed the placement. That's also up for debate. Um, we're working hard on deciding, is that the right time to do that? Or is that a little bit too late to do that? Some people like the idea of, as soon as I publish the placement to the student, then that should be checked off. So I'd love to hear from you guys what your thoughts are about the timing of when that green check mark should go into effect. Uh, many of us internally have our very strong opinions, but of course the most opinion, uh, most important opinion is yours. So we'd love to hear about when do you feel that green check mark should be checked. Um, and again, just drop me a note by email. Um, if you have any thoughts on that, we would love to hear from you guys. But putting together the pieces here and a big step forward and we will continue to build on this in coming releases. All right, we've also now taken contact information and put it as a part of the profile. I'll be honest with you, this always felt a little unnatural to me that a student's address was not part of their profile. We kind of segregated it somewhere else. Um, it felt a little unnatural for our students as well. So what we've done is we've taken that and we've combined it together. So now across the top ribbon, you'll see one less section because contact information, including emergency contact, addresses, phone numbers, those types of things are now a part of that profile information. So a little bit more streamlined, a little bit more intuitive. All right. Additionally, we've made some uh, edits to how a student shares their profile link. So of course, you know a student can share their profile link using this button in the upper right. You guys as school users can do the same. And when you click on this button, the drawer opens and we've got a new option here where you can see what completed placements do you want to include in the profile link. So just like we've given you the option to decide which compliance documents you want to include or which contact information you want to include, you can now also choose which completed placements you want to include. So you can check, check the box once, that will include them all, or you can do so selectively. That's really nice if a student was, partic uh, particularly if a student was unsuccessful in a placement you might want not want to share um, externally that those placements had happened because of course the world of healthcare is small and you never know who's gonna know whom. Um, or you may just choose not to share those because it's not relevant uh, for the information that you're sharing or the reason that the profile is being shared. So just one more layer that allows both you and your students to customize what information is included in that profile link. And again, you'll see this available when you use the share profile link button in the upper right corner of the student's profile. While we're in the upper right corner of the student's profile, I also wanna point out the view as button. So you guys are likely very familiar with the view as feature. This is a feature that of course lets you do exactly what it says, view the system as the student, right? So if you click that button, you would see the, the system exactly the way that Grace sees it. This button has always lived here in the top right corner of a student's profile. Additionally, it used to live all the way to the right on your list of students. When you first land on that student's page, you used to be able to scroll all the way over to the right and you would see that button listed there for every, every student. We have removed that because we found that most people were going into a student's profile and, and, and doing it directly from there. It was sucking down a lot of valuable real estate and it wasn't really being used that often. So now if you wanna view as a particular student, you open up their profile and you use the button in the upper right. So that is what's new in students. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to sites, but again, please interrupt me with questions in the Q&A if anything comes up. The first thing that's really exciting in sites is that we've made the search feature so much better. So we did this for our students section last release. We're doing this for sites section this release, and you'll continue to see this rolling out for more and more sections. But essentially what happens is when you're on that first page, 
of all of your sites listed out and you apply filters or you search for any criteria and you leave that page by going into a site's profile and you come back, it used to be that you would lose your work, right? Your, your searches or your filters would be cleared out and that's no longer the case. So we've made your search or your filter what we call sticky. So anytime you go back to your list of sites, it's there waiting for you. You can easily clear it out start fresh, but you won't be losing your work now, which is really nice. Additionally, the search bar is now a smart search. So you don't have to pick from the drop down. oh, I want to search by state and type in the state, or I want to search by, you know, site name and type in the site name. You can type whatever you'd like into that bar and it's going to search. So it works a lot more like a Google type search might work. You type in whatever and you just hit search. No need to choose a parameter. So nice improvements in the um, searching and filtering capabilities here in site that mirror what we've already done in students and what we plan to do in other sections of the system. So just like we had for students, we also now have four sites set up. And what you can do here, again, you'll see this continue to grow. And the first thing that um, that we've put in there for you, right now it's labeled lookup management. I don't care for that label. We are working on improving that. But these are all, you know, we looked at all the different ways that you can organize your students by adding their campus, by adding their group, by adding their category. Same thing here in sites. We're giving you that ability to create site categories and then add those to your sites. So, for example, you know, you may have sites that use only for practicum two, right? So you might create a category that says clinical practicum two, and you would attach that to the site or to the location. Um, so this is, that again, that first step of putting the control in your hands and letting you decide how you want to configure uh, the organization of your sites and of your locations. This uh, categories field can be used to selectively do a lot of things like send a slot request or send emails um, or any other kind of site outreach that you'd like to do. So a really powerful section um, that is making a comeback. We had this in our older version and we thought, okay, well, we've got our tags, that should work well. And, you know, we really talked with a lot of clients who told us how helpful they found this feature. Um, and we've brought it forward now to this version as well. So site categories are there for you. What's wonderful is that they believe they behave rather in the exact same way that all other items in sites and locations behave. So just as if you set a requirement at the site level, it would be automatically applied to all locations, or you put a setting at the site level, it's automatically applied to all locations. Same thing with your category. If you put a category at the site level, it's automatically applied to all locations. But you can go into an individual location and apply a category just to that location or make any edits that are needed. So this sort of inheritance from sites to locations works exactly the same way as it does in documents, in settings, in requirements. Right? It's that same logic and that same workflow. of Whatever's added at the site applies to all locations. And then you can make um, individual edits at each location or add information at individual locations. So that same workflow applies here too. So really nice consistency. Speaking of locations, we have redesigned the way a location page looks. So you may recall before, if you went into a location, you would see the list of all of the locations listed on the left, and then you'd see a secondary navigation ribbon at the top, and it was a bit confusing, honestly. Um, those two ribbons looked a lot alike and it wasn't always clear where you were. Um, we also found that people were not moved between locations very often. So what we've done now is when you're in a site, perhaps we're in the site Alliance Medical Center, and I said, okay, let's go to locations. Instead of seeing that list of locations on the left and the profile for the location on the right, what we're showing you is just a list of all of your locations. And once you select the location where you want to work, you'll see a very clear navigation panel on the left. So you're not seeing anything about navigating through and within the site. You're just right in the profile for that location. Clear, easy to understand. Your screen is not cluttered with a lot of other information that you likely weren't using. And everything else about this is exactly the same. 
So instead of having two ribbons at the top, one for site, one for location, you just have your location menu there on the left um, to help you navigate within the location. We've done the same for personnel. Again, I'm in a site, I click on personnel, I see a list of all of my personnel and I click on their name to see the profile and the ability to move between and uh, sorry within that profile on the left hand side there. So a little bit more intuitive, a little bit easier to follow um, and I'd love to hear your feedback on these two new redesigns. These are big shifts in the user interface or what we call the UI, the way that the screen looks but the features that you'll find there are still exactly the same. So the content hasn't changed at all, it's just the way that we're presenting it to you. So I'd love to hear from you guys once you've had some time to work with this. What do you think? Does this work better for you? Is it easier to understand? Um, so let me know how this is going. Speaking of personnel, we know that clinical personnel can work at multiple different locations. We also understand that clinical personnel may work at locations that are associated with different sites. For example, as a therapist, I may work full-time at a hospital, but then part-time I may also work at an outpatient clinic that is not affiliated with the hospital. So when you're associating a person, you know, it's the same workflow that we had before, you'll put them at the site and you'll say, okay, which locations do, you, do they work at? And you'll do that by going into the profile for that person and clicking on associate location. And what you'll see first is the ability to associate that person with locations from that site. Right? So we're in Alliance Medical Center, we've gone into Adriana's profile, and the first thing we can do is associate Adriana with locations from Alliance Medical Center. But the second step in that process is I can also associate Adriana with locations from any other site in the system. So before there used to be a bunch of additional superfluous steps of associating sites and a lot of unnatural steps that didn't necessarily feel as intuitive as they could be. And we decided just to take all those out because really any person can work anywhere. So first you'll say, okay, do you want to associate this person with any of the locations that are part of this site that you're in? And then the next step is, okay, well, what other sites? Anywhere else, all right? So you can search from all of your locations within the system and decide where else Adriana might work. And then of course, you'll assign the roles. What does she do at each one of those sites? Um, and then formalize and finalize those associations. So really nice that we've removed that step where you have to kind of associate sites and, and create relationships on paper um, just to, to make this work. So direct, where does this person work? Great, let's make it happen. Speaking of making things happen, making contracts happen is so much easier now. So when you are in contract negotiations, very often um, smaller sites will say, you know what, let's just start with your university's boilerplate contract. And so what we've given you the ability to do now is take your university's boilerplate contract, provide it to our support team, and what we'll do is we'll create a template for you. And that's going to allow us to use merge fields in you know, the same way that we send an email, we merge in the site name or we merge in the site address or something of that sort. We can also create a contract for you. So you'll give us your template, we'll build that out. And what you can do is select the template that you want to start with and then click generate contract. And what that's going to do is give you a Word document of your university's boilerplate contract auto filled with the details that we already have on file for that site. So you'll see the site name in there, the address, the contacts, whatever you guys use as a merge field in your boilerplate, we'll fill those in for you. It spits it out as a Word document that you can download, and then that's a nice easy way to begin the contract negotiation process for those sites that are interested in beginning with your template, not theirs. So again, if you have a boilerplate, send that over to our support team and they'll get that started for you and as you can see here you can have multiple boilerplates as well or multiple templates um, so whatever you'd like to do if you want to have three or four different templates in there maybe one that's specific to your program and another one that's an umbrella contract at the university level or one that's a renewal rider or you know whatever you guys happen to have we can make this happen um, and quickly and easily allow you to generate those contracts 
Also, when you're adding contracts, the system will um, add a contract number for you. It'll just add in the next sequential number, uh, which is a great way to be able to keep track of your contracts. Of course, you can override that and manually add in your contract numbers too. But some nice automation happening here in contracts now. All right, so I'll pause just for a moment to give you guys a chance to enter in any questions you may have. We're kind of at the halfway point here. Um, so before we dive into slots, wish lists, and placements, I'll give you guys a moment to type up any questions that may have arisen as we went through students' insights. All right, I'm not seeing any questions in the Q&A. Um, so let's move on with what's new in slots, wish lists, and placements. So we now have a slots dashboard. Um, and it's, it's interesting for people who came on to version four very early on, this, this slots tab was just kind of a laundry list of all of your slots. And we kept saying, it's gonna keep getting better though. It's gonna keep getting better. So we gave you the ability to filter. Then we gave you the ability to email a slot. And now we're giving you some nice analytics. Um, so what will happen is when you come here, you can still get to your laundry list of slots. You just click on the list view, but your default view is going to be the dashboard and you'll see the breakdown of available slots versus slots that have been filled per sitting. You'll see that by rotation and you'll see that by status. Um, and this is broken down, of course, by cohort, as most things in the system are today. Um, so you'll be able to see, you know, for my class of 2022, how many slots do I have in this setting? How many have been used? How many are still available? Our PT clients will also see by type. Uh, PT has a couple of specific uh, slot types like first come, first serve or interview required, resume required. Um, a lot of other domains don't use that. So we've created this for PT clients. If you find that your domain would find this to be useful or does use different types of slots, that's a conversation you can have with your CSR to see how we can best support you in, um, in analyzing those different slot types as well. So a nice visual overview of the slots that you have. Again, you'll just go to that same place that you used to find your laundry list and your default view is now going to be dashboard, but the laundry list is still available to you in that list view. In the email interface for sending slot requests, we have a bunch of new things available here as well. First and foremost, for emails that you have scheduled, you said send them later and we haven't yet sent them out, you can stop that. So you can say, I scheduled that to send that next, you know, next week, but I actually don't want to. So you can select that and then click cancel. You can also resend any email. Perhaps if you're speaking to whoever you sent the email to and they say, you know what, I never got that. You can come here and quickly resend that. It's like, well, you got it, you opened it, right? Or you got it, you clicked the link. We can see that kind of stuff, but they may have lost track of it and that's okay, right? So you can just quickly and easily resend that email too. Um, so really nice um, improvements to this, um, this interface. The other thing that we've improved is your slot request response report. So our PT programs all sent out their request for slots for the upcoming year on March 1st. And so we're, they're very focused on analyzing what responses are coming in. This report is available for all domains because everyone does send that slot request. You just do it at different times of the year. So we have made some refinements to this report. The first one is that we can see not only that a slot was offered, but now we can see by whom and who made the most recent update. So in this top one, we can see David offered the slot, but John came in and made that made an update to that slot on March 16th. So you can see who made the original offer and who made any updates or any edits um, to that offer. Additionally, you used to just be able to see like, yes, a slot was offered, but you couldn't see what type of slots were offered or how many or what's sitting. And so now we've added an additional tab to this report that tells you exactly that, right? What's the site? What's the location? What's the setting? How many students can they take? What is the status of that slot? The type of slot? Super, all the good details are here for you now. So lots and lots more information on the export of the slot request response report. 
for our PA clients, um, we have now the ability to create a setting-based wish list. So this is for the instance where you don't want students to select from slots that have been offered. You don't want students to select from the list of clinical sites that you have. You just want to hear from the students, all right, what settings are you interested in? Like, is your top choice pediatrics? Is your top choice emergency medicine? Like, what, where are your interests? So this is what that type of wish list will do. So what happens is you'll set it up in the same way that you would set up any wish list. And again, if you need more help on that, your CSR can take you through. And the student will see something like this. Now bear with me on this screenshot. It's not a very clear screenshot because there's a bunch of junk data, but essentially what this would be is your list of settings that you have configured for your program. So you might see family medicine, emergency medicine, general surgery, you know, pediatrics, OBGYN, something like that. And the students will see just that list of settings that you have created for your program and they'll be able to add or remove them to their preference list over here on the right and decide what order they want them to appear. So they can say, hey, yeah, let me put um, inpatient acute general on there. Let me drag that all the way up to be my first choice. And then inpatient neuro rehab, I don't wanna put that on there, actually remove it, those types of things. So students can create a wish list predicated upon simply the settings in your system. No need to focus on sites. No need to focus on locations or slots, just the settings. And as with any other wish list, you can configure questions, open-ended free text questions, and then the student can review and submit their responses. Of note, a student's preference on a setting-based wish list like this one cannot be used in our auto placement algorithm yet. We're still working towards that. So right now, this is kind of an information only, a way to gather from your students what are they interested in. And we're continuing to work towards how we can use this information in an auto placement sort of scenario. So for right now, it's just gathering their preferences um, for your information or for analysis kind of outside of exact. And we'll continue to work towards a solution. The other thing that you can do is thinking about that laundry list of sites, right? Remember we said we go to slots and we can pick the dashboard view to get that overview or we can look at the laundry list. If we're looking at the laundry list, we can email slots to students, which we've had the ability to do for a while, but now what we've done is given the students the ability to do something with that. So again, continuing to take steps forward. So for example, if I got this slot from Abundant Health and Rehab and it turned out this was a first come first serve slot, I wanted to let my students know about it right away. I wanted to email them to tell them about it or I want to put this on their dashboard. I want to say, hey guys, we just heard from Abundant. Let me know if you're interested. We got to act fast. That's the type of situation where you might use this feature. So you'll check the checkbox and you can either choose to send an email or publish those slots. And we're going to take a careful look at published slots because email slots has actually been there for a while. So looking at published slots, what you do is you decide the students that you want to share it with. It could be all the students or it could be, you know, a, a select number. And then you'll click the publish slots button. And what that does is on the student side, when they log in, they're going to see, oh, four published slots. Interesting. They can click there and they'll see that list of four published slots and be able to say, you know, I'm not interested or, ooh, I am interested in that slot. And that communicates over to the school side. The student will see the confirmation they'll just in, and the date and time on which they said that they were interested. And then on the school side, what you'll see is, okay, I have a student who is interested in this slot. So right now, this is where the workflow stops. So before we were only able to email, now we can publish and gather interest. And then our next step is going to be making a placement from that. So you can see that one student is interested. You can click to learn who is that student. But the step of making a placement would still involve you going to the placements tab, clicking it, making that placement sort of manually. So we haven't quite finished the process yet, but big steps forward in terms of gathering student interest in some of those first come first serve slots or slots that you wanna be able to give your students a jump on. Um, this is currently activated only for our PT clients, um, simply because as I mentioned, the, the instance of a first come first serve slot or an interview only slot as you know, one of many different types of slots is pretty unique to the physical therapy domain. That said, following our last release or following our next release rather in late April, if you wanna use this, let us know. 
And I'll remind you guys of that during our next walkthrough. Um, so available for PT right now, and then we can turn this on for any other professions after our April release. So sometimes you place your students by, um, by group, right? You have multiple students placed at a single location. And so something like this example here, right? Mary and Rachel and Amy and a different Mary are all placed at Palomar. So if we're sending an email notification to Palomar, we can, as you guys know, decide to send, okay, an individual email for each student, right? So four students means four individual emails. Or we can send one email to the site that says, here's all of the four students who are coming. All of that information in one email. Of course, the group email is great when you're sending it to the site contact. The separate email is great when you're sending it to the site contact with the intention of them forwarding it along to the individual instructing clinicians. Um, you know, you've got four students, four individual instructing clinicians. HIPAA and FERPA wise, we don't want to give the link to the other three students to an instructor who's not working with them. But if you wanted to send this only to the site contact who needs this information for all students, you can, of course, say group all these placements in one email. And when you do that, you're going to get your same usual um, email template editor, and there's going to be a new merge field that allows you to include the student's profile links. So it used to be when you sent group placements, there was no way to include the profile links. We didn't have the ability to have multiple links in a single email, but now you do. Um, so there's a new, new merge field for available for you there to be able to include multiple profile links in a single email now when we're sending those group emails. Statuses are also improved um, when I'm emailing or a student to let them know about their placement or when I'm publishing a placement to a student. It used to just say placement published. Well, okay, when? <laughs> if my student is saying I'm not seeing it, it's helpful for me to know like, okay, I published it two weeks ago or, oh gosh, I didn't publish it. So it just used to say published and we've now added in the date. So not only do you know that it was published, but you also know when, um, which really helps you problem solve with your students. In our learning activities section, um, we've now added in a reports tab, which allows you just to be able to access all of the raw data reports from across learning activities. So before you had to go to the dashboard, you had to go into a particular learning activity within an individual course and run the report there. And it was just a lot of clicks to get to the report that you needed. Whereas here now on this reports tab, you can see raw data for evaluations, per rotation report for patient logs, you know, aggregate report for patient logs and you'll see more reports continue to populate here so just quick access to many of those reports that were kind of buried a little bit deeper in the system than most people liked we've pulled all those reports together to give you a one-stop shop taking a careful look at the patient log uh, piece we have um, statistics that are now available per course so if you've been into a course entry lately, you've noticed that this left side is starting to explode. And we're seeing our learning activities per course, we're seeing the students registered per course. So if you wanted to get patient log statistics per course, you can do that now. So you would go into the curriculum section, you select your course offering, um, and then you'd come to your patient log section, and you'd be able to click on the statistics box, um, next to any student and view the statistics for that student for that course. Um, so you don't have to look at it per rotation, you don't have to look at it um, per placement, you can also look at it per course. Um, and you're going to see more and more start coming forward on these course-based screens. So if you haven't had a chance to dive in and look at this left side menu and kind of click around and play around to see what's there, I would encourage you to do that. There's a lot of interesting things coming along here. Again, in the very early stages of development, you'll see more and more each release. And this is one of the first pieces um, that I wanted to showcase for you guys. Of course, when you click that button, the drawer opens up and then this is where you can see those statistics. And this is the same statistics drawer that you're already familiar with. So just a different way to access it per course. Um, and again, we're moving heavily towards this per course view. So start playing around. There's gonna be so much more to come here. 
Within evaluations, um, we've made a bunch of, none of my screenshots are here. Well, that's disappointing. I'll talk you through it. <laughs> um, actually, let me see if I have um, something live in the system for us to take a look at, um, because there are some really nice improvements here. Uh, the first one is about distribution of your evaluations. So it used to be uh, that these, um, the options for who you wanted to send your, um, for who you wanted to send these evaluations to were limited um, or and very difficult to understand. So it would say like POR, site staff, um, supervisor, and POR and supervisor are not fields that we have anywhere in the system. So now you'll see easy to understand labels like the preceptor that was added by the school, the preceptor that was added by the student, the, st uh, the, st uh, the site at the staff. The staff at the site, I apologize, guys, I've not finished my coffee yet today. So easy to understand who you're selecting, and I apologize that I don't have um, a good example to show here. Um, let me see if I can, mm. yeah, I'm not sure that I'm gonna be able to find one on the fly, and I apologize, but the big improvement here is that the, these drop-down options are, are, are much easier to understand. When we look at our review screen in evaluations, we also see um, a number of improvements there as well. And I just realized why I can't see anything. I'm in the wrong cohort. Let's give that another try. Great, okay, we've got data now. <laughs> so let's say I wanted to distribute the evaluation for Patty Gonzalez, and I really only wanted to send it to the preceptor that I as the school added. I can just uncheck this, say okay, I want to send it to Patty and just the preceptor added by the school and proceed from there. So much easier to understand drop down values. Our review screen is also um, improved. We see a lot of information here about um, the due date, the submission date. We can click on the audit log to be able to see what the changes in the status um, were, right? The student submitted it or the CI submitted it. It's pending school review as of October 4th or here we can see it became in progress um, when the preceptor started it, right? So we can see a lot more information here on the uh, review screens as well. All right, and again, my apologies for the lack of screenshots. So learning activities, time off and time sheet. So we've had a couple of different improvements here. And the first one is when you're creating a time sheet, you can also decide, does the student have the ability to put in the number of patient encounters that they've had for each time entry? So some disciplines like to do, you know, formal patient logging. Um, and they have the students fill out a patient log that says, I saw this student, this patient with you know, these demographics and we did these procedures. And so for those types of domains or those types of professions, this is not useful. But some professions just care, okay, you were there for eight hours. How many patient encounters did you have in eight hours? I don't need to know about the encounters, just how many, right? So we have this nice new option that will allow you to ask that question allow the students to enter the number of patients encounters for each time entry. Additionally, when students are adding in um, time entries, they can also say that they've taken a break. So it used to be you would enter in your morning, you would, and then you would enter in a second one uh, for your afternoon if you took a lunch break. Whereas now you can say I worked eight to four and I took 45 minutes for lunch or something like that. So a new field here that helps you more accurately capture the time that your students are spending in clinic um, and the types of things that they're doing with that time in terms of how many students or how many patients rather are they seeing. To round things out, we've made a couple of improvements to plan, which is our curriculum management section. Um, some of these you're going to see if you use curriculum management or not, um, and some of them are specific and unique to our curriculum management clients. Um, so some of these you'll benefit from, others you may not see if you don't subscribe to plan. Um, but the first thing is for our clients who subscribe only to plan, right? They don't have clinical education management. They have just the curriculum management. They now have access to the students section. They didn't have that access before, um, but they do now so that they can create student cohorts um, and then those types of things. 
right? So they'll be able to see the students list, but they won't be able to invite students or add students. Again, just basic visibility. So when you're creating a course offering, one of the questions you're asked is, does this course require placement? Um, so when you do that, it's a lot easier to understand now. We used to have like, oh, is it clinical or didactic? Which wasn't really 100% clear, right? Very often for your didactic courses, you may want to make an integrated placement or a part-time placement. So just because it's a didactic course doesn't mean you don't have to have a placement. So we decided to clear this up and turn it into what is this question really asking? Does this course offering require a placement or not? If yes, it says yes. If no, it says no. So very easy to understand. That's the view on the course catalog. Um, on the course offerings screen, what we see is a purple, uh, purple, a brown P that denotes the need for placement. And the same is true on your curriculum grid, right? You'll again see that brown P. So it's very clear which courses require a placement versus which do not. Um, and that is the end of our release items for um, for March. Um, I do see one question, and Susan, I'm so sorry that I missed your question when you asked it about how do you get there again. Um, I'm just going to give you the ability to unmute, and you can let me know um, where is it that you're interested in getting to, and I apologize for having um, missed you. So where was it you were wondering about? No problem. It was the per student statistics by course. I just wasn't sure yes. where you entered to get to that area. Yep. Great question because that wasn't clear. I appreciate your asking. So what you'll do is you'll go to curriculum, right? So again, we're going in by course now. So we're not going in, you know, through what we call our cohort based screens, right? So when you go to learning activities, everything is by cohort. We've got our class of 2022 filter on here and then we go in per rotation, right? We say block one, show me my patient logs. So if you wanted to do that by course, you first select the course. So you go to curriculum. And then you will select your course that you're interested in. And then under course activities, you'll see patient log. And then that's where you would go. Unfortunately, I don't have any students who have done patient logs for this course, but this is where you would find that information. Um, I'm gonna just go ahead and put on a filter that's gonna help me find that more robust data. There we go, that should help. And so this is where you'll find those, <laughs> there we go, yep, exactly. Um, so then this is where you would find that and you would click the statistics button here. So you're gonna see more and more happen within, um, within courses. So again, you would just select your course from the course offerings, the list of course offerings, and go into it. You can use your filters to see what cohort or what professional year. So if I wanna see class of 2022, their didactic year only, um, I could apply that and get only those courses um, or those types of things. So the filters are available for you here too. So this is where you will go to, the, to see that. Any other questions um, while I'm live here in the system? All right, one other thing I wanted to let you know about for our clients who use our curriculum management platform is um, shared course offerings. And basically what that means is if you have a course that's on two different curriculum maps, say for example, you've got a course that you know two different groups of students take together. So you're doing a map for your class of 2022 and you're doing a map for your class of 2023 but actually 22 and 23 have taken the same course at the same time they were all in the classroom together. You shouldn't have to map that one course two times, right? So if you have a single course that's on multiple curriculum maps and those maps are set up in the exact same way, for example, you know, class of 2022 and class of 2023 all took their anatomy class together, fall of the 2022-23 academic year. Um, they all sat there together. They all took the same courses and both curriculums or both cohorts rather you're mapping to the same accreditation standards right so you're mapping class of 2022 to CAPTI standard sevens you're mapping class of 2023 to CAPTI standard sevens again you shouldn't have to do that twice 
So now we have the option to do to to see it as a shared course offering. So if it's the same course offering on two different curriculum maps, but those curriculum maps are set up in the same way, you only have to map one. So it saves you a lot of work. That's a pretty convoluted. Um, <laughs> Pretty convoluted feature if you haven't yet used our curriculum mapping. Um, it's a huge time saver if you have used it and you understand what that means. Um, so co connect more with your plan, CSR, if that didn't make sense to you. But again, big time saver. You can map a course once and it will reflect on any um, curriculum map where the, the setup of the mapping is, is the same. Um, there's no really good way to do that because there's no visual representation. So I can't even show you what I'm talking about other than to say that it is a thing that, that happens. And I apologize for being less than effective in my explanation of that. Um, and with that, I will leave you guys. Um, I appreciate your time in this walkthrough. I'm always available for questions. You can reach me at megan.freeland, just like it sounds, F as in Frank, R-E-E-L-A, N as in Nancy, D as in David, at exact.com. Um, so I'm always here for questions, comments, concerns. You should get an email tomorrow with a link to the recording of this session that you can share with anyone you'd like. So feel free to pass it along. Also, um, the megaphone icon in the upper right corner, you will see the uh, link to the recording at here as well. So you don't even need to look for that email. It'll be here for you. Um, and that is all I have for you. So enjoy the rest of your Wednesday and please be in touch with questions or feedback or comments. I would love to hear from you. Have a great day.